Welcome back to our brief study of what the Bible is. And it's called Taking God at His Word because I've got this book from Kevin DeYoung called Taking, God's, Taking God at His Word. And I found it to be a really helpful book to explain some really important things about what it is we have in the Bible. So last week, we considered the question of how do we know what we know? How do you know that something's true? And how do you really know that that something is true? And the three main ways of doing that is one is if you observe it, if you are there, if you're a witness, if you see it, if you hear it, if you taste it, you can know that something is true because you see it by your experience. A second way is if you hear it from an eyewitness, if somebody was there and they saw something, you can believe that what he said is true because he saw it and he's telling you those words. And a third way, which is how to know something a little bit different is if somebody tells you about himself, he reveals himself to you. He tells you something about who he is what he knows, what he's like, what he likes, what he doesn't like. Um, and that's what we might call a self-revelation, right? I tell you about me and you know about me. And the reason why those things are important is those are some of the reasons that we know that what we have in the Bible and the word of God is true. First of all, because we have um, eyewitnesses. A lot of the way that the Bible speaks in the New Testament, especially are Jesus' disciples were with him. They saw him. They saw what he did. They heard what he said. And, and they're telling us, this is what we saw, and it's an eyewitness account. But secondly, a lot of what the New Testament is also is it's God revealing himself. The Lord himself told his disciples these things that they would never know about God otherwise. Um, and through the Holy Spirit, those words are preserved. Those understandings are truthfully written down for us in a way that's never changing. And we've got written before us so that, that Christians throughout centuries can all know the exact same thing about what God wants us to to know. And it's an amazing thing. And the Bible isn't just words on a page exactly, um, but the Bible says that it's living and active, a two-edged sword that can um, you know, pierce into our souls and know us. And it's because it's the Word of God and, it's, and the Holy Spirit uses it to, to teach us. So it is, the point is, is that there's a real treasure that we have in the Word of God. And over the next four weeks, um, I want to teach you four things that we can know about the Bible. And that's why I've got this. And this is how we can remember it. Scan, the word scan. And the four things about the Bible that we're going to learn starting this week are the sufficiency of the Bible, meaning that the Bible's enough. It contains everything that we need to know to be saved by God and to please God. C is for um, the clarity of God's word. The Bible speaks in a way that we can understand it. We can read the words and we can understand what it says, the clarity. So sufficiency, clarity, A is um, the authority of the Bible. Right? The Bible is the final authority. There's many things in the world that are true, that I can know are true. But in the end, the Bible is the one sure foundation um, that measures everything else. So if we have a question, if our pastor tells us something, we can believe it because we trust him and we know that he's a student of the Bible. But ultimately, it's if the Bible says it, we can believe it. And that's why we call it the final authority. And then finally, the end is the necessity of the Bible. Without the Bible, we actually can't really know God. We can't really know, especially what he has done to save us from our sin and to make us children of God. So sufficiency, clarity, authority, and the necessity of the Bible. But today is the sufficiency of the Bible. So as we do this, can you please open your Bible to Hebrews chapter one? I'm already there, but as I introduce this, you can turn to Hebrews chapter one, and we're going to learn about the sufficiency of scripture, the sufficiency of the Bible. So have you ever wondered, um, do you ever wish that you could know exactly you know, what you were supposed to do? Um, do you sometimes wish God would tell you, you know, just do this, you know, instead of leaving it up to ourselves to try to figure things out? Have you ever wished that he would speak to you personally? Um, and not just, not just in the Bible that everybody else has, but something special for, you know, for Walter, you know, this is my word for you for right now. Um, and so we're going to address some of those things, but the point is, is that what we have in the Bible is what God has provided for us. And it's sufficient for us to know everything that we need to, to have faith in Jesus and to please God. So if you're with Hebrews chapter one with me, we just want to read the first few verses and understand what they have to say about Jesus and what that means for the Bible. So it starts like this. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. So it starts off by saying, over these many, many years, the Old Testament was written over more than a thousand years. And, um, and God spoke in many different ways. Like think about how did God communicate with people uh, in the Old Testament. Well, sometimes he gave them dreams. You know, Joseph famously, you know, had dreams about how his 
brothers and mother and father would be bowing down to him. And then the Pharaoh had a dream that Joseph interpreted. Jacob had a dream about angels ascending and descending, you know, from heaven on this giant staircase or ladder. And God would speak through these dreams. Sometimes he would speak through visions. Some of the prophets had crazy visions, right? Daniel had visions about these four beasts that represented world powers that would come across um, in the future. Sometimes God would actually just speak through words. He would speak to um, Abraham or he spoke to Joshua. And oftentimes it was as the angel of the Lord, right? Somebody who looked like a person, but the people knew that it wasn't just a person. It wasn't even just an angel, but it was the Lord himself. And most amazingly, God actually spoke to Moses and said face to face, like a man speaks to a friend. This doesn't mean that God, I mean, it could be that God spoke to him as the angel of the Lord, as just as Jesus was a man, he could reveal himself that way. But face to face could also just mean, like it says, just like a man speaks to his friend, clear, plain language. And God spoke in various ways through all this time. And and he, it, he said enough to teach them about who God was, that he was holy and good, and that he was going to be for Israel and save his people and draw his people back in, and, and that we provide a savior. But it wasn't always as clear as we know God now. But it goes on and says, long ago, God spoke like this, but in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. Who's that? Well, it's Jesus, of course. He spoke to us by his son. Um, and so consider, now God has spoken all for many years is one way, but now he's speaking through his son. But why is that important? Well, it says his son, whom he appointed as heir of all things, through whom he created the world. Did you know that God created the world through Jesus? Jesus wasn't just born one day like the rest of us, right? But he was always the son of God for all time. And it was actually through Jesus that God created the world. And verse three is amazing. He, Jesus, is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. So when, when Jesus came into the world, he looked like a man, but when people saw him touching, reaching out and touching with compassion, a sick man to heal him, someone who nobody else would ever touch, we could see the compassion of God the Father in that because when you see Jesus, you are seeing the heart of God. When, um, when you see Jesus forgive um, and restore a sinful woman, um, you're seeing the kindness and the compassion of God the Father who rejoices to forgive and to see the repentance of other people. When you see Jesus walk into the temple and overturn the tables and drive people out, when you see him rebuke the false religious teachers, you can see it get a glimpse of the anger that God feels toward people that would lead, toward people that would lead God's people astray and not let them worship him appropriately. Philip said at one point to Jesus, Lord, show us the Father and that'll be enough for us. And do you remember what Jesus said? This is in John 14. He said, Philip, have I been with you this long and you still don't know who I am? And he says, if you have seen the Father, or if you have seen me, you have seen the Father, right? So one way that God reveals himself in this amazing way is through Jesus. We know who God is like no other way. To go on, he says, Jesus um, upholds the universe by the word of his power. And then if you can think of all the amazing things that you would tell someone about Jesus, what would it be? Well, this is a list of those things, is it not? And he says this, after making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. And so finally, it says, not only did Jesus create the world, not only does Jesus sustain the world, not only is Jesus the exact imprint of God's nature, but he, the, the climax, the pinnacle of his work is he made purifications for sin. He sacrificed himself on the cross for the sin of his people, for me, for you, for everyone who trusts in him, he takes away our sin and makes us children of God. And then he was raised up. And right now he even reigns at the right hand of God. So Jesus has done everything that needs to be done for us to become children of God. He's done everything for us um, to take away our guilt and sin. He's done everything for us to help us to trust in him, which is what we need to do if we're going to be called God's people. He's done everything that we need um, through his spirit to allow us to please God. He has done, he's accomplished his mission. He has done everything that he needs to do. There's nothing left for him to do except one day when he returns and brings us home. So what does this have to do with the Bible? Well, um, the whole Bible is really about Jesus from beginning to end. It's about how God created the world, how, 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 how the man and woman turned away from God and throughout history, how God is preparing the world for a savior who would draw people back to him. And he has done that in Jesus, right? 
It says God has spoken now through his son. If Jesus has done everything that we need to have faith and to, to do things pleasing to God, and that's been spoken through Jesus and written down in the New Testament, there's nothing else to be said. What else is there that we actually need in order to, to know anything about Jesus? Do we need to know anything else in order to be saved? Well, no, the Bible tells us clearly what Jesus has done for us. Do we need to know anything to believe the promises of God that if we confess our sins, that he's faithful and just um, to forgive our sins? No, it's, it's, it's already here. Do we need anything else in order to know what's pleasing to God, what we ought to do and what we ought to avoid? Well, no, it's, it's right here. Um, and it's because Jesus has done everything and he's accomplished his work. He's fulfilled all the work of the Father. There's nothing left. This is all that we need. It's amazing. Let me just read three more passages um, of scripture and then we'll, we'll, we'll close up. So the first one I want to read is from um, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse uh, 23. It says this. It says, um, since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and abiding word of God. How are we born again? It's through the word of God. It's by hearing about, well, sometimes through literally reading about um, Jesus in the Bible. Sometimes it's hearing a preacher teach about it. And sometimes it's just somebody telling you the truth that's in the Bible, that Jesus saves sinners. So we are born again. We, we become children of God through the word of God. It's sufficient for that. The second thing I want to read to you is um, 2 Timothy 3 and uh, verses 16 and 17. And many of you have heard this if you've been in Awana, but it says this. It says, all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may, may be complete, equipped for every good work. Equipped for every good work. The Bible has everything that we need to rebuke us, <laughs> to chasten us, to tell us when we have sin. Um, it, everything that we need to, um, to know what's right and good. Everything is here to equip the man of God, the woman of God, the child of God for every good work. And then finally, I'm going to turn back to Deuteronomy 32. And this is the end of God's first revelation to the people, the law of God. Um, but the same idea really applies to all of us. So Deuteronomy 32 and verses 46 and 47 say this. God said to them, uh, well, Moses said to them, take to heart all the words by which I am warning you today, that you may command them to your children, that they may be careful to do all the words of this law. For it is no empty word for you, but your very life. And by this word, you shall live long in the land that you're going to. He says, this word is your very life. Treasure it, know it, abide by it. It's that important. So this is the Bible that we have, this thick book with 66 little books in it that are all the word of God. It's sufficient for everything that we need to know God, to trust God, to trust Jesus, and to live lives um, that are pleasing to him. It's true it doesn't tell us what to do every single minute of every day. And there are good reasons for that. I mean, God knows why he did it in his wisdom this way. But a couple of things that occur to me is one is it teaches us to live by faith, right? If God says, trust him, you know, we ought to trust him. If he says that we ought to, if someone um, um, asks for forgiveness, we ought to just forgive. Even if we think, you know what, that's not smart. They're just going to keep doing the same thing to me over and over again. No, God says, trust him and keep forgiving. And so we trust him and, um, and so on. And secondly, this gives us freedom to live lives for God in creative ways. Instead of being told what to do each minute of every day, we get to sit down and think. We can pray to God. We can ask for wisdom and think, how can I please somebody today? How can I please my brother, my sister, mom, dad? How can I please my kids? How can I do things that are going to benefit the kingdom of God? And I can sit and think about it. I can try to accomplish it. And you know what a great feeling it is to know a job well done? We get to do that. We get to participate with God in doing good works, building up his kingdom, and then seeing how God takes these small things that we do and do great things with them. And so I want to encourage you, when you have questions, when you have trouble, when you're suffering, when you have pain, always rely on the word of God. Now, if I've got a problem, it's hard for me to go through a thousand pages and figure out exactly what I need. But what I do is, when I'm not in trouble, read the Bible, study the Bible, understand it so that I can go back to it when I have problems. Or even if I just have to, if I've got problems, I want to pray about it to God, I might just look into the Bible and see what that word in the Bible says to me. So don't forget to check the questions that are under the video, and we're going to discuss them in small groups. Um, so I, I, my prayer is that you would learn to trust the Bible, trust the word in the Bible, and treasure it. Understand that it is sufficient for everything that we need. It's clear enough for us to understand what's, what's in it. It's our final authority. We can trust it. Um, 
And it's really, we need it. It's like a treasure to us that the Holy Spirit uses to teach us. So God bless you and we'll see you next week.